Tennessee Football Classics, Vintage Orange, is brought to you by First Tennessee Bank, the official bank of the Vols, by State Farm Insurance, and the more than 400 State Farm agents in Tennessee who support volunteer football. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. By Ford and your Tennessee Ford dealers, where you'll find quality people, quality products throughout Tennessee. And by Budweiser. Choosing a designated driver is always a good game plan. Hi everyone, I'm Bob Kessling of the Ball Network and welcome to this edition of Tennessee Football Classics Vintage Orange. In 1963, Tennessee struggled to a 5-5 five and five record. After only one year as the head coach of the Volunteers, Jim McDonald was replaced by a young assistant coach off Frank Broyles' Arkansas staff. He was a former Florida quarterback by the name of Doug Dickey. Dickey's first team had a long uphill battle. Here's a look at Coach Dickey's first team at Tennessee. The 1964 University of Tennessee Volunteers could be called the New Look Vols because for the first time, Tennessee will not be using their famous single wing offense this year. The Vols will go to the T formation, directed by their youthful new head coach, Doug Dickey, shown talking with UT Athletics Director Bob Woodruff, who was Dickey's coach at Florida, where the new Vol mentor was a quarterback. Dickey has been a chief lieutenant to Frank Broyles at Arkansas before becoming head man of the Volunteers. Meet the other members of the ball coaching staff. Charlie Rash, Bill Anderson, Jimmy Dunn, Vince Gibson, Charlie Coffey, Bill Majors, George Cathigo, freshman coach George McKinney, assistant Jack Kyle, assistant coach Chuck Rowe, and veteran trainer Mickey O'Brien. Captain of the 1964 balls will be All-American guard Steve DeLong a 243-pound senior who finds himself in a new defensive position as middleman in the Vols front. He'll probably be used more on defense than offense this year. Now let's meet the other Vols, starting with the ends where a speedy sophomore Paul Newmoff rates as a top pass receiver, along with other flankmen, 196-pound senior Al Tanera, who hopes to recover from a knee operation, and hustling Bobby Frazier, a 190-pound junior. Another top receiver is junior Glenn Gray, 188-pounder. Then there's junior Gerald Woods, a fine blocker, and sophomore Johnny Mills, a 192-pounder. Ball tackles are young but determined, with the likes of Joe Graham, 218-pound sophomore, Mac Gentry, 202-pound Knoxville sophomore, and senior Carl Ellis, alternate captain who's moved from guard to tackle this year. Junior Joe Falco is a 215-pounder who's tough and aggressive. Jim Lowe, a 221-pound junior whose primary strength is on offense, and sophomore Terry Bird has made tremendous strides. Backing up All-American DeLong at guard will be Tom Fisher, moved from center to be used mostly as a linebacker, as will former blocking back Sam Robertson. Also seeing service at guard will be 211-pound junior Bill Cameron, 202-pound junior Clay Harkle-Rose, and tough 208-pound sophomore Bobby Morrell. Junior Frank Emanuel will be listed as a center, but will be used mostly on defense as a linebacker. With Norbert Ackerman, 208-pound senior, used mainly on offense, and 218-pound junior Reggie Jellicorse at center. Former tailback Hal Wantland, a junior from Columbia, will lead the balls at T quarterback. Strong as a runner, Wantland is a great competitor who works to succeed. Behind Wantland at quarterback stands sophomore Dewey Warren, 196-pounder, who's a good runner and passer, and junior David Leak will also see service as an extra point kicker. Junior Billy Tomlinson will see plenty of offensive halfback service, as will Jack Patterson, a 189-pound junior from Nashville. John Patey has the speed and desire to become a top-notch running back. Jackie Cotton is a 196-pound junior from Memphis. Bobby Gratz is a terror on defense. Hard-running Stan Mitchell leads the hopefuls at fullback for the New Look ball, backed up by speedy Jimmy Sullivan. Three balls will be used primarily as defensive backs. Bobby Petrella, 181-pound junior. Jerry Smith, 174-pound sophomore. And another sophomore, 180-pound Carl Stansel. Sharing the funny beauties will be specialists Ron Whitby and Dennis Gibson, both sophomores. These are the balls of 1964 with a new coach, a new system, 
but the old volunteer spirit that promises every opponent an exciting afternoon of Southeastern Conference football. University of Tennessee Sports. Emotion, excitement, tradition. Brought to you by Men of Measure, Men of Stature. Big and Tall Clothiers. Fashion, Fit, Selection, and Savings. By St. Mary's Health System. By Little Debbie Snacks. Unwrap a smile today. And by Hound Dogs, Tennessee's largest UT store. Our thanks to these Tennessee companies who proudly support Big Orange Athletics. You know where they're going, right? <laughs> Hound Dogs, we don't see the 107,000 fans. We just support them. Welcome back to Tennessee Football Classics Vintage Orange. Doug Dickey's first team at Tennessee in 1964 went four, five, and one. But there were some dramatic changes. One, Tennessee went from the single wing to the T formation and a quarterback under center. So in the second campaign, 1965, big improvements were expected. Here's a look at the 65 highlights narrated by the Vol Network's George Mooney. The Tennessee Volunteers of 1965, picked by the experts to finish no higher than eighth in the Southeastern Conference, were one of the surprise teams of college football. Ignoring the dire predictions made for them, the Vols last spring held a squad meeting and dedicated themselves to working determinedly to achieve a successful record. When the season finally came to an end December 18th, the Volunteers could look back on a year in which their accomplishments had won for them a golden niche in the great tradition of University of Tennessee football. The Vols ended the season with a record of eight victories against only one loss, and that by a single point. They were tied twice, but one of the ties came against Alabama, 1965's National Collegiate Champion. Tennessee played in and won the championship of the Blue Bonnet Bowl. The Vols finished third in the Southeastern Conference and were ranked seventh in the final wire service bowl. They boasted an authentic All-American and linebacker Frank Emanuel and their brilliant young coach, 33-year-old Doug Dickey, was named Coach of the Year in the Southeastern Conference. It was quite a season for the Volunteers, one we feel you'll enjoy recalling with us as we review the highlights from the opening game with Army to the Blue Bonnet Bowl victory in Houston in mid-December. And here are some of the players who made Tennessee's 1965 season a brilliant success. First, members of the offensive unit. At end, Austin Denny, Husky 220-pounder from Nashville, whose sure hands made him a dependable pass receiver. At tackle, a big, strong newcomer, John Boynton, who came to UT from Pikeville and made the All-Southeastern Conference sophomore team. At guard, Gerald Woods of Milan, Tennessee, whose pass blocking was important in the ball stepped up offense. At center, Reggie Jellicorse of Morristown, who alternated with All-Sophomore selection Bob Johnson. At guard, a second-team All-SEC selection, Bobby Gratz of Morristown. At tackle, Jim Lowe of South Fulton, a senior who was a big man on the forward wall as the balls improved their blocking week by week. At split end, Johnny Mills, a junior from Elizabethton, who set a new single-game ball receiving record when he snared 10 against UCLA. Another valuable member of the offensive cast, senior David Leak of Memphis, dependable place kicker and capable also as a split end. Charlie Fulton of Memphis, a sophomore quarterback whose play before he was injured at midseason stamped him as a potential volunteer great. At wingback, Hal Watson of Columbia, whose play exemplified the spirit of college football. Hal won the Jacobs Trophy as the best blocker in the Southeastern Conference. The tailback of the 1965 Vols is elusive Walter Chadwick of Decatur, Georgia, speedy broken field tread who was picked on the all-Southeastern Conference sophomore team. Stan Mitchell, a hard-hitting fullback from Sparta, one of the top hands in the country at picking up vital first down yardage. And Dewey Warren, a sophomore quarterback from Savannah, Georgia, who in only four games set a new Tennessee season record for pass completion. 
Here are some of the Vols' defensive standouts. At end, Bobby Frazier of Bartow, Florida, whose steady play earned him recognition as an all-Southeastern Conference flanker. At tackle, Bill Cameron of Rayford, North Carolina, called on to play a new position. Bill responded with dependable work throughout the 1965 campaign. At middle guard from College Grove, Bobby Morrell, a rugged competitor who gained competence as the season progressed. Another defensive tackle, Mac Gentry of Knoxville, whose drive and dedication blended perfectly with his keen football mind. At end, Paul Newmoff, a ball hawking junior from Columbus, Ohio, who came up with many key plays for the defensive unit. Frank Emanuel, rugged linebacker from Newport News, Virginia, an All-American who rates as one of the great defensive football players in Tennessee's proud history. Talented Tom Fisher of Brooksville, Florida, team with Emanuel to form a linebacking tandem generally recognized as the best in the nation. The monster man of the volunteers, ball hawking, Doug Archibald, a junior from Sarasota, Florida. At defensive halfback, Jerry Smith, a junior from Thomasville, North Carolina, dangerous as a punt return specialist. Another defensive halfback, Harold Stansel, one of the fastest members of the squad. Hal is a junior from Knoxville. The reliable safety man, Bob Petrella of South Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, rated by his coaches as one of the top men in the South at this important position. The Vols began the thrilling 1965 season with an intersectional clash against Army. A crowd of almost 50,000 watches at Neyland Stadium as fullback Stan Mitchell romped 46 yards in the first quarter to the Cadet 22. On the next play, quarterback Charlie Fulton flips the pass to wingback Hal Wantlin, and the Vols' great captain races down the sideline for the remaining 22 yards. Tennessee leads 7 to nothing as David Leake adds the extra point. The Vols strike again just before the first half ends. Fulton catches Army by surprise with a pass to tight end Austin Denny. The touchdown play covering 53 yards. The powerfully built Denny pulls his way out of the grasp of an Army tackler to go in for the score. Jerry Smith, the slippery punt return artist, seals the verdict away in the fourth period when he takes an army kick and sprints 65 yards for the final touchdown. Bobby Frazier, Doug Archibald, and Glenn Gray contribute vital blocks to help clear the way. Tennessee gets off to a promising start in the 1965 campaign by turning back the cadets of Army 21 to nothing. finishes second in the Southeastern Conference and wins a berth in the Liberty Bowl. Tennessee draws first blood when junior linebacker Tom Fisher darts through the Tiger line to block this first quarter kick. Max Gentry recovers and the balls are in business on the Auburn 27. Two plays are instrumental in the touchdown drive. Here, Charlie Fulton hits his rangy end, Johnny Mills, for a 14-yard pickup to the six. Then, Fulton finds running room around right end for the first touchdown in this 17th renewal of one of the Southeastern Conference's most closely fought rivalries. David Leake's conversion puts Tennessee ahead, seven to nothing. With Auburn driving in the second period, Defensive back Carol Stansel averts a score with an interception of a Tom Bryan pass in the second quarter. But Auburn gets the ball right back, and Bryan edges over for the TD from the one. The extra point kick fails, and Tennessee nurses a slim 7-6 lead at halftime. The ball score again in the third period. 20 crucial yards are gained in this pass from Fulton to Mills. Three plays later, Fulton, the sophomore quarterback from Memphis, sprints into the end zone from the 13 with the help of a key block by Mills. 
The Vols go into the fourth quarter with a 13-6 lead. The Auburn game ends in the 13-13 deadlock when the Tigers register a tying touchdown in the final period. Tom Bryan tosses a short pass to Hank Hall, climaxing a 35-yard mark. The tie leaves Tennessee with a record of one win and a tie going into the next week's homecoming game with South Carolina. It's homecoming on the hill at Knoxville, and the Vols entertain thousands of old grads with their finest offensive display of the young season. A key play in a 47-yard scoring march is the second quarter, run by sophomore tailback Walter Chadwick. It gains 14 yards. Ron Jarvis picks up a vital first down as he rambles to the South Carolina 16-yard line. It's Chadwick's turn again, and the dandy speedster from Decatur, Georgia, carries around left end for the final five yards. With the help of David Leake's 44-yard field goal, the ball jump ahead 10 to nothing. South Carolina scores a field goal shortly before the half ends, but the Vols bounce back for another score in the third period. The fleet Charlie Fulton carries 19 yards to the Gamecock seven. Two plays later, Chadwick puts the ball in the end zone from the two as he bounces off three South Carolina defenders with a tremendous display of extra effort. Tennessee goes on top by 17 to three. Another ball touchdown cinches a victory in the final period. Chadwick, taking advantage of effective blocking by a vastly improved line, romps with a pitch out from his own 42 to South Carolina's 25. Hal Wantlin, winner of the coveted Jacob Trophy as the best blocker in the Southeastern Conference, is instrumental in springing Chadwick for the 33-yard pickup. Then David Leake, more often used as a kicking specialist, shows his versatility as he gets loose from his split end position and hauls in a 25-yard touchdown strike from Fulton. Tennessee makes a howling success of homecoming with a 24-3 victory over South Carolina. With a record of two wins and one tie, Tennessee moves into its great traditional place with Alabama. 70,000 fans at Birmingham's Legion Field see a titanic defensive struggle interrupted by two second quarter TDs. Doug Archibald blocks David Ray's field goal attempt. And the Vols inaugurate their scoring drive from their own 31. A pass from Fulton to Wantland covers 21 yards and moves the balls into Alabama territory. Then Fulton advances the ball 20 more yards with this run to the get Tennessee into scoring position. Another pass, Fulton to Mills picks up 13 more yards and the balls are knocking at the TD door. Deep in Crimson Tide territory, the power of Stan Mitchell cannot be denied. The ball senior fullback rolls to the Alabama one. Then Mitchell dives across for the TD. David Leake's conversion puts Tennessee on top, seven to nothing. <laughs> Alabama comes right back to knock the score. The big play in an 80-yard touchdown drive is... 28 yards. Then Sloan, the Southeastern Conference's most valuable player, connects with Dickie Thompson for another first down at the ball two. Fighting the clock, Alabama tallies on the final play of the half with Sloan taking up the final yard in a 7-7 tie game. For over 15 years, Jack and Augie have been serving the needs of big and tall guys across the Southeast as the South's largest. Men of measure and men of stature, big and tall clothiers. Guarantee fashion, fit, selection, and saving. We use our buying power to bring you the finest selection and name brands you trust, like Cutter and Buck, vibrant, sophisticated fashion, suitable for sports, fun, and business, priced right every day. Visit any one of our locations in Knoxville, Nashville, and Johnson City, or online at www.menov.com. Imagine autumn in East Tennessee with no color at all. by Hound Dogs. Hound Dogs, the ultimate Tennessee sports store.
this thing going around called sniffing. You think you're getting high, but the dizzy, fuzzy feeling is just what happens when your brain doesn't get oxygen. The chemicals get in the way. So it's like you're not breathing. How sniffing causes brain damage and death. So when you think you're sniffing, your brain thinks you're drowning. And your brain is pretty much right. Welcome back to Tennessee Football Classics Vintage Orange. After the first four games of the 1965 season, Tennessee was still undefeated, 2-0-2. But the Monday morning following the Alabama game, the season took a dramatic twist. Three members of the Tennessee coaching staff, Bill Majors, Bob Jones, and Charlie Rash, were killed in a car wreck on their way to work that morning. Houston came to town for game five. The volunteers donned black crosses in the middle of their orange tees on the side of their helmets, and dedicated the rest of the season to their three fallen coaches. Three Tennessee assistant coaches die in a car train collision in Knoxville the Monday following the Alabama game. The Vol squad dedicates its play for the remainder of the season to their memory. After a scoreless first half against Houston, Tennessee goes ahead 10-0 on David Leak's 20-yard field goal, and this determined pass interception returned by Doug Archibald. In the final period, Stan Mitchell recovers a fumble on a punt, and Tennessee has possession on the Houston 23-yard line. The powerful Mitchell cracked through for 12 yards to the 11. And two plays later, Chadwick goes the last yard for the TD. Tennessee rolls past Houston 17 to 8, setting the stage for the critical game with Georgia Tech. It's the pageantry of college football at its spectacular best when Georgia Tech and Tennessee met in Knoxville before 52,000 fans, the largest crowd ever to see a sports event in the state of Tennessee. Time after time, Tennessee turns back Tech drives in the first half. A crucial touchdown save is made by defensive back Bob Petrella, whose perfect timing produces an interception in the end zone. The half ends with the two team blocked in a scoreless stalemate. In the third quarter, Carol Stansel electrifies the overflow audience when he snatches an errant Kim King pass and rambles 36 yards for the ball's first score. Tennessee mounts a drive for a second TD. Fulton shows his heels to the Yellow Jackets as he gets loose on this 57-yard jaunt, which carries all the way to the Tech 23. <laughs> Mitchell takes the pitch out and fights his way to the Tech 3-yard line. A pass from Fulton to Wantlin and second down surprises the engineers and gives Tennessee a two-touchdown lead midway through the third period. The balls wrap up all their scoring in one quarter when they go 66 yards for still another TD. Fulton's pass to Wantlin covering 13 yards gives the march momentum. From the Tech 15, Fulton fires a pass to Austin Denny and the big end from Nashville moves the ball to the two. Dan Mitchell, always reliable for picking up the tough short yardage, leaps across from the two as Tennessee delights the tremendous Neyland Stadium crowd with a 21-7 victory over Georgia Tech's Yellow Jackets. Long-time rivals, 
Tennessee and Ole Miss clash in Memphis, beautiful new Memorial Stadium in early November. Dewey Warren taking over at quarterback for Charlie Fulton, who was injured on the first play, guides the ball to a first quarter TD. Chadwick goes off tackle to set up the score with this brilliant 51-yard maneuver. unable to find a receiver keeps for seven more yards to the Ole Miss 12. It requires seven more plays but Stan Mitchell climaxes the 80 yard mark by diving across from the one with David Lee converting the ball going front seven to nothing. Ole Miss comes back to score following the ensuing kickoff in which Doug Cunningham breaks loose for a 69-yard return. out of bounds by safety man Bobby Petrella. From the ball four, Ole Miss scores in two plays. Jimmy Heidel's pass to Cunningham moves the Rebels to the one, where Jerry Smith's jarring tackle momentarily prevents the touchdown. But reserve quarterback Joe Graves then charges into the end zone as Ole Miss pulls into a 7-7 tie at the half. Tennessee assumes command again early in the third period when Petrella's interception of a Heidel pass gives the ball possession at the Ole Miss 23. Chadwick then crashes to the nine to give the ball first and goal. Finally, Chadwick picks up the last two yards and Tennessee goes ahead of Mississippi, 13 to seven. On a third down play from his own territory, Graves gets a vital first down for Ole Miss with this 10 yard pickup. Graves again exhibits his capacity to come through in the clutch when he hits Rocky Fleming for nine yards on this fourth down pass. The veteran Mike Dennis, one of the South's premier runners, carries across for an Ole Miss TD to deadlock the game at 13 apiece. Then the decisive extra point. Jimmy Key's kick is good, and Ole Miss and Tennessee's only loss of the year, 14 to 13. a possible bowl bid, Tennessee travels to Lexington, Kentucky to take on the talented Wildcats. The Vols' rugged goal line defense is never better than in the second quarter, as illustrated by this series of plays from inside the Tennessee Six. Led by the great All-America linebacker Frank Emanuel, the proud Tennessee defenders hurl back Kentucky's charge. The Wildcats turn to their top offensive weapon, halfback Roger Bird, but the Corbin Sr. finds a going treacherous against the aggressive volunteer defenders. On fourth down, Emmanuel and teammates stop the Wildcats at the one. Glenn Gray, Derek Weatherford, Tom Fisher, Bob Petrella, and the other members of the defensive unit chalk up another successful goal line stand. A 3-3 halftime lead is shattered when Doug Archibald, the ball's valuable monster man, picks off a Kentucky pass and sets up a touchdown with this interception return to the two. Quarterback Warren on a keeper covers the remaining two yards to put Tennessee on top, 10 to 3.
Gillert, ball defense, sets up a clinching touchdown in the third quarter. Emmanuel latches on to a deflected pass and brings the interception back to the Wildcats 21. Warren charges ahead for nine yards to put the balls within scoring distance. Again, it's Warren, the fast-developing sophomore from Savannah. The resourceful young quarterback gets the last three yards for the ball's second TD. One of the most spectacular plays of the afternoon takes place in the fourth quarter when Derek Weatherford, Glenn Gray, and Paul Newmark chase Kentucky quarterback Harry Beatles into his own end zone for a safety. Tennessee regains possession of the beer barrel that symbolizes supremacy in this great series with a 19-3 win. The jubilant fall squad immediately accepts an invitation to play in the Blue Bonnet Bowl, December 18th at Houston. Tennessee moved out to a fast start in its final Neyland Stadium appearance against intrastate rival Vanderbilt. Dan Mitchell rambles 62 yards for a touchdown that puts the balls in front of Vanderbilt 7 to nothing. Mitchell's strength foils one would-be tackler while blocked by Watson and Chadwick keeps other Commodore defenders away. scores a field goal to make it 7-3, but the balls drive 80 yards in the second period for another touchdown. Warren's pass to Mitchell accounts for 15 yards and puts the ball at the ball 39. The balls pick up 19 more yards as Warren fires the strike to Chadwick, who heads down the sideline into Bandy territory. Tennessee moves into a 14-3 lead when a Warren to Austin Denny pass covers the final 20 yards. Again, the balls compress all their scoring into a single period. In this case, the second quarter. Paul Newmoff, junior end from Columbus, Ohio, pounces on a Commodore fumble at the Bandy 23. The key play. In the short playoff drive, sees Hal Watson make a nifty catch of a Warren pass before he's knocked out of bounds at the two. Defendable himself, Stan Mitchell gets the last yard needed for the score as the ball rolls past their interstate rival Vanderbilt 21 to 3. The most exciting game of the year took place in Memphis when Rose Bowl bound UCLA collided with Blue Bonnet Bowl bound Tennessee in a fantastic offensive circuit. UCLA scores early, but Tennessee comes right back to not to score at the end of the first period. Warren finds Watson for a 13 yard gain and a first down at midfield. Warren enjoying a record-shattering passing day for the ball. Completes one to end Johnny Mills at the 25. Again, the ball moves through the air. Warren passes to Chadwick. The play advancing the ball to the Bruins 13. Touchdown, Tennessee. Dewey Warren hits Hal Watlin for the score. the extra point. The balls forge ahead in the second period. Chadwick darts ahead for 23 yards on a first down at the UCLA 36. Warren connects on a throw to Mitchell, advancing the ball 15 yards to the 11. This time, Warren keeps from the one, and Tennessee goes ahead. 14 to 7. The game takes on the appearance of a volunteer romp late in the second period when Warren's 26 yard pass to Watson produces a third Tennessee touchdown. The fired up balls leave the field at halftime 20 to 7. But the complexion changes suddenly at the start of the third period when UCLA posts two quick touchdowns. 
Here quarterback Gary Beban runs through the ball defense, 36 yards for a score. Two plays later, the ball squirts from the arms of a Tennessee back into the hands of UCLA's Tim McIntyre, who races into the end zone. The Sun Balls now trail 21 to 20. UCLA scores still another third quarter touchdown, but the Balls start the uphill climb toward victory as Warren DeMille clicks for 15 yards. Again, Warren hits Mills, this time for 11 yards and a first down at the Bruin 27. In one of the most spectacular plays of the game, Warren passes to Mills, who laterals to Chadwick. The speedy Chadwick moves all the way to the seven before he's knocked out of bounds. Chadwick then covers the remaining seven yards to bring the ball to within two points of the Bruins at 26 to 28. The ball set their offensive machinery in motion again. Warren, who manages to throw the ball just as he is being tackled, completes it to Austin Denny. The play gains 15 yards. When UCLA slows the Tennessee drive, David Leake's 20-yard field goal puts the balls on top once more, 29 to 28. Now it's the Californians' turn to score. Kirk Altenberg takes the pass from Biban and carries all the way into the ball end zone. But there's a clip, and the ball is set back to the ball 21. UCLA goes on to a touchdown in four plays and moves ahead in the seesaw battle, 34 to 29. The decisive Tennessee touchdown drive starts with three and a half minutes remaining. That familiar passing tandem of Warren to Mills is good for 16 yards. Warren lets fire again, this time to Chadwick. The play gains 20 yards and gives UT a first down at the UCLA 5. On fourth down at the 1, Dewey Warren rolls around in for the touchdown that brings victory to Tennessee, 37 to 34. serve snacks. How convenient. Touch up paint. Oops. Bendix brakes. TRW tie rods. Rabbit's foot. Advance Auto Parts carries more parts than any other store, including one you won't find anywhere else. First driving lesson. Advance Auto Parts. The best part is our people. The end of a surprising season in which the Vols gained final ranking as the seventh best team in the nation came with the playing of the Blue Bonnet Bowl at Houston in mid-December. The Vols take on Missouri Valley champion Tulsa in a driving rain. On the opening play, Bob Petrella recovers a Tulsa fumble following a hurricane pass completion. Doug Archibald's tackle jarred the ball loose. Dewey Warren sets up the opening score when he connects on a throw to Hal Wafflin for 20 yards. This time, the distance is shorter, but again, it's Warren to Wafflin, the play covering four yards for the touchdown. Ties the count with a first quarter touchdown of its own. But the ball set up shop once more when Emmanuel comes up with the recovery of a Tulsa fumble at the Hurricane 33. Warren goes to work and scrambles for 14 yards before he's brought down at the Tulsa 16. Charlie Fulton finally recovered from an ankle injury that sidelined him in the Ole Miss game. Scoots ahead for 15 big yards, all the way to the one. 
Warren picks up the final yard in the touchdown march as the balls go ahead for Keith midway through the second period. Jerry Smith's brilliant punt return through rain and mud covers 45 yards with a vital block thrown by the gritty captain of the Volunteers, Hal Wantlin. Three plays later, Warren crosses a goal to widen Tennessee's lead to 20 to 6. A spectacular ball pass defense bags another of four interceptions turned in by the Orange Horses against Tulsa as Glenn Gray pulls the ball in and returns to the Hurricane 43. Rugged fullback Stan Mitchell tears off the final 11 yards for the volunteer score to wrap up a 27 to 6 victory. The triumph limps the ball to an overall record of eight wins, one loss, and two ties.
Y'all want to have a look at our fitness center? Yeah. Yeah. This is one of the nicest common walls around. Use your legs. Take it back nice and slow. Don't hit me this time. Whoa. Whoa. I got it. Go right there. Yeah, I'll get this. Excuse me, Peggy. Yes, sir. I got it. Well, sister, Peyton and I have been thinking. Yeah, we're thinking you're pretty good at this sports stuff, but maybe... Maybe you should stick to the emergency room. There's a lot of sick people there. Yeah, sister, a lot of sick people. I could do this all day. <laughs> Zone. Saturday starting at 4, only on the Travel Channel. My name is Alana Obi. I see my family out there. They're all my children, they're all my kids. They may not be my children biologically, but they are still my family. The playgrounds used to be infested, but now my children have a place to play. We bond together and we take care of the problem. See, once you have a family bond, it's like nothing can break through that. It's worth the effort. As long as there's breathing life in this neighborhood, it's worth the effort. We're watching. This is my block. This is my family. The 1965 Tennessee Volunteers will long be known for facing adversity and the tragedy of losing their three assistant coaches in midseason and still fighting through to a remarkable 8-1-2 record. Tennessee closed the 65 season with that victory over Tulsa in the Blue Bonnet Bowl. It was Tennessee's first bowl win since 1957 when the Volunteers beat Texas A&M 3-0 in the Gator Bowl. Thanks for being with us for this edition of Tennessee Football Classics Vintage Orange. I'm Bob Kessling of the Ball Network. Tennessee Football Classics Vintage Orange.